Chris. Thanks, Roland. Thanks for the introduction. And thank you for being here. I'm actually really excited to be giving a talk mostly in person to a live audience. Please feel free to stop me throughout the talk and ask any questions as they come up. Um, and I will start by coming clean. I told Roland I was going to talk about the geologic fingerprints of multifold earthquakes in Southern California. That's a lie, actually. And the reason for that is, oh, this is not quite changing. There you go. This is a lie. And the reason for that is that uh, between when Roland asked me for a seminar title and between now, I got really excited about some results. These are not peer reviewed. They're not published. They need to be double checked. And I figure it would be a lot more fun to have a lively discussion about these things that are not out there yet. The things that are published, you can read the paper, but this you get to experience it as it develops. So my talk today is titled Awful Deformation Over the Earthquake Cycle. And to give you a quick outline, I'm gonna start by talking about the work that Roland referenced earlier, talking about inelastic deformation or rock damage from the 2019 Bridgecrest earthquakes. That's my blue dot and couple of the garbage balls there. Then I will move on to start talking about the fate of this awful deformation over longer timescales. I will review my Ridgecrest result in the context of previous Eastern California shears and earthquakes. Those are the blue dots for Landers, Hector Mine, and El Mayor Kukapa. And then in the end, I will expand beyond California to talk a little bit about folks in Utah, but also in the Model Plateau of Northern California and in Bishop. And I will be looking at how awful deformation sort of piles in the landscape over really, really long time scales and what that tells us about how fault zones evolve over time. So Without further ado, let's get started with Ridgecrest. And my work for Ridgecrest is focused on fault damage zones. Everyone loves damage zones. Why? Well, they are an energy sink. They modify the elastic properties of the upper crust. And over time, they gather a lot of attention from geologists, from geodesists, from geophysicists alike. And one of the challenges that comes from getting all of this attention is that we all have slightly different definitions for what a damage zone is. So before we can talk about damage zones from different data sets, we need to actually discuss how each of these subfields of geoscience defines a damage zone. So when we, geologically, we define damage zones as the volume around the fault that is warped or fractured. And typically, like fractured density will be its highest next to the fault and decrease following some nonlinear relationship like a power law or an exponential decay until it reaches some sort of background that's shown in the top plot there from some work by Mitchell and Volker. Seismologically, we sometimes define damage zone as the volume where aftershock density decreases as we move away from the fault. That's pretty similar to the fracture density decrease. And again, until that aftershock density reaches some sort of background. Geodetically, we talk about damage zones well, a as a zone of decreasing rigidity around the fault, or for earthquakes that are directly connected from imagery, we talk at, of damage zones as the area where the strain exceeds the elastic limit of the rock. So I'm just going to look here so I can point to my slide better. Um, so for example, from the work, work of Chelsea Scott at ASU over there, the area is bounded by the black lines in uh, yellow and Blue represent the areas where that elastic limit has been exceeded, everything away from that. Oh, the laser pointer? Oh, yeah. Thank you. That is the great. battery may run out at some point. But... Okay, let me make sure I don't want someone with this. Okay. <laughs> um, and then seismologically, we can image damage zones as the area of decreased shear wave velocity surrounding the fault. So, fault is here in the middle, and you can see that shear wave. Increases as you move away from it. This is from the work of Elizabeth Cochrane imaging the college report. And a persistent question in damage zone studies among all of these fields has been whether damage zones have breaks in scaling. So there are different physics operating in the different distances away from the fault. Uh, this is from the seminal work of Powers and Jordan, and they looked at the decrease in aftershock density with distance away from faults during the interseismic period. They did this for a series of faults in Southern California. And what they found was that all, uh, sorry, uh, aftershock density stays somewhat constant until it hits a corner here, then it decreases following a constant slope until it meets that regional background. And from these observations, they developed 
a model of the damage zone that's shown here where the there's an inner damage zone that's defined by one or multiple both cores and beyond that inner damage zone aftershock density or fracture density will decrease following this constant slope until it meets the regional background a challenge with damage zone studies is that the data sets have different resolutions and they also span different spatial temporal scales. For example, when we characterize the damage zone in the geological record, the fractures that are there, we don't know how many earthquakes they account for. We don't know whether they may have moved a seismically during the post seismic or inter seismic periods. And to try to reconcile all of these different spatial temporal scales, we came to the 2019 Bridgeport earthquakes in Southern California, which were super heavily monitored from geologic, geodetic, and seismological observations. So in this work, I'm going to be describing a series of data sets that then I'm going to lump together to try to understand what the damage zone of the Bridgecrest fault looks like. So I'm going to start by talking about three different raptor maps that we used in our study. The first one is the map of Ponte et al. 2020. That's not shown in this figure, and that map was compiled through a combination of fieldwork and uh, geodetic measurements. It's a map of cracks based in field observations and geodesy. The second map I'm going to use is my own map of the Richfield 2019 LIDAR data. This is post earthquake LIDAR, it was collected a month after the event, and I mapped fractures based on it. So roughly this north-south trending feature is the rapture of the magnitude 7.1, and this east-west roughly trending feature is the foreshock, the 6.4 foreshock. I'm going to be uh, adding an additional uh, data set, an additional raptor map, which is marked by the areas covered by these orange polygons. In those areas, we had high-resolution drone imagery available from which we mapped the fractures at some 2 to 20 centimeter per pixel resolution, which is the map shown down there. And don't focus on that too much because I'm going to show you this map like zoomed out and we're going to spend some time on it in a second. The last data sets I'm going to incorporate are two earthquake catalogs, the QTM earthquake catalog and the SESN earthquake catalog. I say the names for those of you that may work with these data sets regularly. And the epicenters from the QTM catalogs are shown here. This doesn't change slightly, I see. Okay, so zooming into that data set from the high resolution drone imagery, uh, this is a portion of the 6.4 of the foreshock. And what I want you to notice here is how complex the fault zone is. When you can image it at this resolution, you can see there are multiple fault strands. You can see there are portions like here where the fault sort of goes blind and you have these widespread distributed deformation on top. It localizes again, it distributes one more time. And even though it's a little bit hard to see, I want to bring your attention to the fact that these cracks go all the way to the footprint of the data set. They're not limited to where the fault is. Here's a picture of what that actually looks like in the field. You have a fault scar up here. It's really large, it has like 30 centimeters plus vertical displacement. And then you have this chaos of cracks distributing away from the fault scar. This is Alba, yes. Are, these these are all associated directly with the slip on the fault. Not they're not from lateral spreading. Or no, they're uh, we do not distinguish cracks based on what generated them. So we know there are several mechanisms contributing to this. Some of these are off tectonic origin associated with the static stress change during the earthquake. Some of these are related to ground shaking from the passage of waves, uh, and some of these even are related to liquefaction. We can tell the liquefaction ones apart because they have they have these arguate shapes that are very distinct, but between ground shaking and static crack formation, we do not distinguish them. So the way we treat cracks in this study is if it's there's a crack, it's part of the damage zone. And the idea is that these all happen at the same time. Uh, no, we don't know. The idea is that all of these were active during the earthquake, whether they are inactivated or pre-existing, we do not know. From the sediment, we suspect most of them are nuclear during the earthquake. And I'll show you some evidence for that later on in the talk. So uh, but, uh, can I ask yes. a question? Do you have a sense how deep those cracks uh, extend to? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Um, no, I will be comparing what I see at the surface with what we image with tomography and making the argument that I think what we see at the surface 
with like some like very fast decrease. Uh, I, I think what we see at the surface roughly represents what we see on the very shallow crust, like top three kilometers. So I, I, I imagine that the density we see at the surface will decrease pretty rapidly, but the zones we image at depth roughly agree with the width of what we're gonna image at the surface. Uh, and if I don't convince you with the argument when that time's come, ping me again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm actually gonna skip this on the interest of time. Okay, one more thing I said, I forgot about this. Um, we also look at the distribution of superficial strain and this is based on image correlation maps. Uh, and this is, what you're looking at here is stacked profiles of the photos in the middle and each of these rows represents 138 meters along strike of the fold that have been stacked and we computed the shear strain in 12 meter windows. So you can see here uh, and the color intensity represents the strain magnitude. And you can see that the really high strains are pretty <coughs> limited to the near fold area. Uh, in fact, like if you take the elastic strain limit as, as 10 to the minus three, which is what we typically use in this sort of studies, that's about 80 to 100 and something meters away from the fold. So to study the damage zone, I'm gonna put together all of these data sets and I'm gonna average them along the rupture and I'm gonna consider the decay of an elastic deformation as we move away from the fault. And I think it's worth pointing out right now that every time I say inelastic deformation, I just mean a point at which the material has yielded. That may be through fracture. That's most of what we see after shocks of fractures. It may also be uh, in the form of warping or block rotations, which would be captured by those strain maps. Strain maps don't really distinguish what's generating the strain. They just tell you the magnitude of the strain. So I'm gonna start looking at feature density. This is aftershocks on the y-axis that is a number per meter square and then fall perpendicular distance on the x-axis. And I'm fitting these decays with the expression of powers in Jordan 2010, the expression I showed you earlier. And this expression has a few terms. Let's start by looking at V-naught. V-naught is the intercept, is the fracture density near the fault. D is the corner that bounds the end of the location where the aftershock density or fracture density stays constant. Gamma is the slope of the decay. So it's a power law exponent, but here in log log, it's the slope of that decay. And then D is the sharpness of the corner, but uh, sorry, M. M is the sharpness of the corner and it's held equal to two here following the practice of powers in Jordan. The value of M doesn't really change what the the case look like it's just one more parameter to fit. So we end up keeping it equal to two like they do. So I'm gonna start populating this plot and it's gonna get busy real quick. But just remember what one of these looks like. Okay, this is the decay in fracture density based on the imagery data. This is what we mapped from the drone from this really, really high resolution images. And you can see the slope between these two plots looks pretty similar, but something's happened that corner has moved super close to the fold. It's really, really close here. It's like about a meter or so. I'm gonna populate the plot with the remaining of our data set, with the LIGAR, with the field class, which is the Ponty et al. Raptor map, and the strain. And what we see again is that these, these slopes as we move away overlap pretty well. But let's be a little bit more quantitative about this. Here in panel B, I'm showing you the distribution. These are the posteriors for gamma. Oh, huh? those I mean, yes. Quick question. When you do the strain, how do you go from strain to fracture density? Yeah, so uh, in the y-axis for strain is not feature density, is the strain magnitude based on the second invariant of the strain tensor. Okay, so that would be another. Yeah, exactly. So yes. there should be a second y-axis label in there for the strain, but it's never converted into something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, when we look at the distribution of slopes, we see that they're hovering around the same values and their posterior distributions overlap in general. Let's look at the parameter D, at that corner that tells us where the breaking scaling, the change from constant damage density to constant decay occurs. For the uh, round, field class and lighter data sets, these overlap pretty well. They're pretty close to the origin. In fact, many of these fits allow for them to be equal to zero. And they are also, I will point out, on the order of the error of the fold location at the surface. 
when we look at the distribution of P for the aftershocks at depth, we find that it's centered around 15 meters. And also, I will point out here that D is within the minimum fault location uncertainty at depth, which is based on the spatial error on the aftershocks themselves. We're not the first ones to think about the distribution of inelastic deformation curvatures. There's a lot of pre-existing work, and I'm gonna be roping that work into this plot slowly. So I'm starting here by adding, this, uh, there's no y-axis associated with this, it's just the x-axis that you wanna focus on. This is strain, and the strain width here means the minimum and maximum width of the zone where strain exceeds the elastic limit of rock. And that is from 20 meters to around uh, 80 meters, I think. And that's based on these maps looking at the, uh, the second invariant of the strain tensor. So the width of this zone when you exceed the elastic limit is the width of that bar on my plot. I'm going to add another data set here. This is from the work of Selene and Korn. And what I'm looking at here is the width of these relative surface displacements. And that's a cryptic name just to indicate that there are these zones of diffuse deformation that include both contributions from elastic processes and inelastic processes within them. And the width of the lines here represent the width of those zones. And those uh, are from the 10 meters to a couple of kilometers. The bars represent the average for the port shock and the main shock respectively. Let's start adding some seismological data to this plot. Here I have added the width of track wave zones and low velocity zones based on four nodal arrays that were deployed after the earthquake. They're here, so they are in the middle of the main shock and then at the tip. So these four nodal arrays, uh, the track wave zones are zones embedded within the low velocity zones where the velocities are slow enough that they can amplify and track the waves. And the low velocity zones just represent the overall width where the velocity is reduced with respect to the overall features. And something that comes out of this is that the maximum, the widths of all of these processes do not overlap. Like none of these widths overlap with those quarters up there. They are all different. And these corners they are occurring within the error of the location of the fault at the surface and at depth. And I think that when we consider these things together, what this is showing us is that fault damage is occurring at continuum, that there's no breaking scaling, that the breaking scaling we're measuring is just an artifact of how well we have located the fault. And this starts bringing in some questions. For example, how sensitive are these damage decays to lithology? And even though the area, so bedrock here is in gray, sediment here is in uh, yellow. The area that we sample in bedrock is very, very small. The, the earthquake rupture overwhelmingly through sediment. But we can look at the fracture density decay for these separate regions. And what we find is that overall they look the same, except for the uh, bedrock density decay is about 1.5 to 4 times smaller than that in the area of sediment. We can also ask how sensitive are these damage decays to the magnitude of on slip or variability of on slip. So this one have a lot of information, but here I have the both. They're color-coded by the amount of lateral slip, right lateral for the main shock, left lateral for the fourth shock. And on top of them, I've plotted the zones where I have my high resolution factor maps. And each of the zones has a color and a number on this table where the first number is the average slip and the second number is the variance of slip. And these are the corresponding density decays for those zones. And we find that the Density decays look quite similar to each other. They are not related to what the slip on the fault or the slip variability within that region is. But we do see that there's quite variability on the fracture density at the intercept for each of these. We can also choose to try a comparison between fracture density and strain intensity. Here, for each of these regions, I have the image differencing strain on uh, the left. And I have fracture density on the right based on the dome maps. And what we find is that roughly 
the areas that have high strain correlate with the areas where we have high fracture densities, but there are areas that have high fracture densities that appear to be isolated from the main fracture that do not really appear on the strain maps. So I think this is just worth taking as a word of caution that when we are using just geodetic products, we may be missing some of these very localized deformation signals that just do not accommodate enough displacement to show up in the geodetic products, but are still a threat to infrastructure that needs to be taken into account. I hope that so far I have convinced you that we can take all of these products and sort of generate a model of what the damage zone is based on the distributions of fractures and aftershocks and strain. And now I'm going to try to convince you that there are ways in which we can use these damage distributions to say something about the physical properties of the damage zone. So I'm going to take my drone density decay and I'm going to transform it into the decrease in shear rigidity in the volume around the fault. And what's hidden in this arrow is the work of Budiansky and O'Connell in the 70s that basically takes a population of fractures in a volume and given certain assumptions about that volume and that population gives you the uh, shear rigidity uh, that reduction that results from that. And in doing so, we find that we have a reduction of about 20% in bedrock and about 60%, uh, sorry, 40% in sediment. And these, uh, you can see that the intensity, the intense rigidity decay is pretty, it's pretty much localized to the near fault region and by a hundred meters away from the fault, the rigidity decreases is tiny. Um, when we compare these to the uh, fault zones image of depth, these areas of reduced shear rigidity, uh, shear velocity, sorry, we find that this width correlates pretty well with the width of the trapped wave zones that were imaged at depth. And from that, we assert that what we're seeing here at the surface is the surface expression of those trapped wave zones that are imaged at depth. These zones uh, span down to about three to five kilometers down dip, and they stay pretty constant in width from what we can resolve given the normal arrays. So there are a couple of things I wanna bring home from this. The first one is that, of course, we want to think of our damage zone as, as a restricted volume uh, that's useful for models. But given we don't have a very clear corner we can use as our effective edge of the damage zone, we need to be really careful when we're thinking about what we're going to call a damage zone in a model. The next mm -hmm. thing I want to point out is that from these nonlinear decays in damage in the surrounding volume for a fall dermic emerge two things. The first one is that the tails of these distributions are really long. They span a really large area going beyond 20 kilometers away from the fault. So the damage zone is this area of widespread regional damage, but also because these decays are extremely nonlinear, that we saw in this very near fault region where the damage is focused. So the change in the physical properties is restricted to that very near fault area, but the damage zone itself expands a much wider regional volume. And I have a few questions that come out of this work for me. The first one is that how much of the damage we map is inherited? How many of those factors are just being reactivated? The second one is how much of the damage is recovered and healed after the earthquake? The, the rigidity decreases we see are super, super large. So part of that, a large part of that has to be recovered. If every earthquake was adding that much rigidity reduction, the crust would be soup in a few earthquakes. So that's just not a realistic one for model. Something has to be happening in between. And then last, I wonder what happens to the cracking zones of dense faulting, such as the Eastern California shear zone, where, you know, a point that's 10 kilometers away from the Ridgecrest fault is five kilometers away from the Garlock, two kilometers away from the next fault over. So at these, as these areas are continuously receiving damage from different earthquakes, what is happening to the properties of the crust over many earthquake cycle that these locations with dense fall to? Then what's what we know which crust is kind of weird. We have this orthogonal pattern. We know that some of the faults get reactivated during the main shock, from the core shock. Is rich crust an exception or is this a good model to think about that themselves? And I'm gonna try to answer some of these. Uh, the first one is rich crust. 
blood or his first percent expression, an exception. This is some work by Bing Lu at the China Earthquake Administration, and we part of it are saying damage decay model from Paris and Jordan to the fracture density decay from the Madoi earthquake last year. And the model works really well, but there are a couple of things that are very different between this earthquake and breakfast. The first one is that this earthquake was largely blind in many of these sections, and this model doesn't work so well for those sections. We're still working on that, so I don't have that plot here. The second one is that the x-axis is much closer to the fault than it was for Richmond. This is just a kilometer away. So maybe, and the slope also is steeper than that for Ridgecrest. So maybe this is a good way to think of the damage zone, but we need to adjust what that slope and extent is going to look like, depending on certain full properties that we haven't quite figured out yet. Hmm. In terms of, this is mostly in sediment. So this is still a test of this model in an earthquake that's predominantly through sediment. How well this applies to a fault zone that's mostly in bedrock, I don't know. I'm waiting till we have an earthquake in bedrock that's monitored as well as Richard's was to test it. Can I ask one question? Yes. Maybe I can be too late, but your case is always assuming the purely bad for a fault. The rich crest and then maybe I didn't know the Madori earthquake. Is there always the purely bad for? Or maybe this one kind of dig? Um, so for the that's a good question. For so that matters for the distance between right, exactly. Atlanta. So I was wondering exactly. how you calculate into the dipping fault. So for ridge press, for the fracture densities at the surface, we take the trace of faults at the surface to measure with respect to. At depth for the aftershocks, we measure the location of the aftershock with respect to the 3D fault plane. So, so if there are the changes place. in depth, that gets accounted for in those. Wow. Here, this is just at the surface, so we're measuring with respect to the full trace. I'm not quite sure what the full dip is for this. I think that assumption works well if your faults are pretty vertical, yeah, if not if right, it will start failing. Um, so that's a good thing to check. In terms of asking whether Rich Chris is an exception, we have an amazing natural laboratory in the eastern Shears, California Shear Zone, which has been producing these fairly large earthquakes with really nicely. Uh, which are really nicely mapped since the 1990s. So let's see if our Rich Chris model works well on this earthquake. I've taken Landers, Hectromite, Alayor, Cucopa, which is mostly in Mexico with a couple of cracks that made it to California. So I'm just going to lump that into the Eastern California Shores now, and then Rich Chris. And when we put those uh, data sets together, and this is a paper that I'm review right now, we find that they roughly overlap in what the damage density decays look like. And from this one, they're like, but this seems like a good way to think of the damage zone as a place that doesn't quite have distinct breaks in scaling when we are looking at these Eastern California shears and earthquakes that have widespread fracturing. Again, would I put my money on using this in a mostly bedrock earthquake? No, not yet, but I'm excited to see the data for that and to test the model there. One of the questions I had was, well, what's happening to these cracks over multiple earthquake cycles? And I was really excited about the prospect of maybe thinking of these cracks as accommodating some mechanical relaxation over time. And then I saw this on Twitter this year. This is 2019 and this is 22. And the answer is that when you're looking at the cracks at the very surface, it is the uh, it is surface processes that are going to modify those scarps and erase that from the landscape. So we're not really gonna get a good answer for mechanical relaxation here. But I think this picture also tells us that the cracks we're looking at in the sediment were newly nucleated during the Richards earthquakes because it's been a couple of years mm -hmm. and they're gone. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna skip the next couple of slides but I can come back to them. It's just thinking about those scarps. And I'm gonna start moving on to the third part of that talk about thinking about awful information over really long time scales. And geologists have made a lot of progress thinking about this based on field observations. But most of our knowledge of the long, of long-lived fault damage zones come from looking at fault zones in bedrock and come from looking at fractures specifically. And we know from recent geodetic observations that fractures are not, fracturing is not the only process that operates in the damage zone. So today, instead of asking how is awful information about accumulated over multiple earthquake cycles, I want to ask a different version of this question. That is, how is subtle awful deformation accumulated over multiple earthquake cycles? So not fractures, but these volumetric changes in the fault zone that we see 
We've seen those for El Mayor Kupaka, this broad zones of deformation. Uh, we've seen these in the work of Celine Antoine for Vitres that I was referring to earlier. So these are zones that have mixed elastic and inelastic deformation. They decouple strains throughout them. It's typically around the order of 10 to the minus three, which stress at the elastic limit of rock. If we're looking at something cosmically, we can't really know if it's permanent or not, just on the basis of does it exceed it. Uh, if it's just at the elastic limit, it will get recovered between the next earthquake. This is the kind of information that we cannot really tap into from cosmic data sets. But if these signals are indeed permanent deformation, they should be piling up in the landscape over time. Maybe a portion of them gets healed and recovered, but not all of it. So where should we go look for these signals? And part of why these have kind of gone unnoticed is because it's really hard to quantify really subtle signals in the landscape. You really you need really, really high resolution data to be able to bridge these different time scales. So we came up with a set of rules. Uh, these three places match the rules. Model Plateau, Needles District, and Volcanic Table Land. These are all locations that have a race of normal falls and a single lithology. And I'm gonna go over our criteria. We built the criteria before finding the places. And we said, okay, if we were to find these really, really subtle signals in a landscape, what would that landscape look like? How would you maximize your chances of finding these signals? The first thing you want in this recipe is you want a homogeneous lithology because you don't want to have to deal with how sensitive local deformation is to lithology. The next thing, uh, this is, sorry, this is a volcanic table land in Bishop, and you can see it's just this big tongue of the Bishop Tower where all of the folds are placed. The next thing we want is we want a place that has an originally planar configuration. We want to know what that rock looks like before it got deformed. Ideally, we want it to be flat so that all of the deformation on top of it has to be related to fault. So that also requires a place to have really low erosion rates. I really like this picture from the volcanic table now because it really illustrates like if this is like a flat thing and everything you see on top of it is a fault. <coughs> so what if we had data that's good enough? So you see the fault here. What if we had data that's good enough that it would let us see any subtle deflections that are beyond the fault? What if we could extend this really obvious distribution of deformation to what's happening all fault? And the answer to that is high resolution topography. So that's the last ingredient that these three places have in common. And I should mention here that all these places have normal faulting. The reason why we choose normal faulting is because we're going to be using LIDAR point clouds to look at the deformation. LIDAR is most sensitive to the vertical signal. So we want a kind of deformation that's maximized in that direction so that we can see as small as possible. So. We are looking here at a cross section through a fault. This is elevation versus distance along the perpendicular profile. Each of these dots comes from the LIDAR point cloud. And this is a fault that has a couple of scarves. It's a composite uh, fault. But I said I was going to talk about awful information. So I'm going to zoom into the foot wall of this fault. And when we look at the foot wall of this fault, we find that beyond the end of the fault scar, we have a deflection that extends all the way to the end of our profile. We start with a really sharp change in slope that then sort of decreases in intensity and that slope is never constant. So there is this subtle warping of the foot wall that's extending pretty far away from where the fault is. Here's our subtle signal for the formation to characterize. If we look at the hanging wall of the fault, the signal is also there. And I will not be using the hanging walls of faults. And the reason for that is because there's a sneaky signal that looks just like that, and that's sand dunes that pile at the base of scarps. And because I'm not in the field looking at each of these faults individually, I'm not going to risk characterizing the sand dune as a fault. So I'm only going to use the foot wall, which is nicely exposed as it were. So focusing on this falling, these are the questions I'm going to be asking. How can we quantitatively describe these faults? What is a good mechanical model for them? How much of the total deformation do they account for? Does awful folding evolve over time as folds accumulate slip? And then last, like what mechanisms are accommodating that strain in their rock folding? So we tried a bunch of different bits, including different flavors of flexure. And what I ended up describing the awful folding best was something extremely simple, which is just Korodovic's 
times the constant. You can see this more compellingly when I square root the x-axis. That whole area has the slope c, and the uh, square root relationship describes it pretty well from some distance away from the fold all the way till the edge of our looking window. And what I'm going to say next may be totally wrong, and you should call me out if it's totally wrong because it's a working hypothesis. So please feel free to crush it. Um, <laughs> but these square root relationships appear a lot in linear elastic fracture mechanics. The linear elastic fracture mechanics is the area beyond the process zone of a crack tip. Uh, the stress in that area is uh, characterized by an inverse for root of x decay. And, uh, and on the top of that, there's uh, the fracture toughness. And to apply this framework to the folds and the data I'm looking at, we need to take a couple steps. First one is that we need to remember that folds have two tips. We have like the typical end of the fold fold tip, but also there is a vertical fold tip in which the fold is propagating in this direction. So all of that edge of the crack is itself a fold tip. The next thing we need to do is so far when I was looking at that, at the folds, we were looking at elevation, and elevation is, is displacement essentially. And here we don't want displacement. What we want to compare, what we want to compare stress to is strain. So in order to get a strain, we need to take the derivative of the displacement. And when I do that, this looks a lot like that. And this is how far we've taken this, uh, and I'd be very happy to discuss it. So I'm going to keep going, but we can make some time for this. Are you able to see evidence of damage or deformation in the folded material? Yes, hold that thought. Okay. And if I don't convince you- I'll hold my breath then. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't convince you, bring it back. And for the this big Ignum bright sheet, you can you can separate what's original deformation from the subsidence and the caldera collapse. Uh, so the thing that posited pretty much as a flood unit that has a little bit of tilt associated to the deposition, that tilt occurs over a much longer wavelength mm -hmm. than the folds. So I think the signal is totally obscured by the folds themselves. There is some. There are some pre-existing textures from the ignimbrite cooling that we're going to see in a second that do affect how the rock performs. So we have a few problems. We have a problem, let me backtrack. When you have a feature, like a fold, you really want to know its amplitude and you really want to know its wavelength. And that's hard here because we have uh, folds that interact with each other, right? These are profiles, each of these is a fold. And each fold is sort of dragging the hanging wall and foot wall of the neighboring fold. So the shape of the fold, it's affected by, and the amplitude of the fold, it's affected by what its neighbor is doing. Mm -hmm. We also have a second problem. This C square root of X relationship works really well for describing the shape of the folds, but it doesn't really have an amplitude or a wavelength. It's not really that we can something, we can apply directly as a proxy to measure those. But we can use some tricks. Um, for example, we can say, well, 100 meters away from the fold, the amplitude of a fold will be given by 10 times C. And we can use that, C, I will remind you, is the slope of that pitch. And we can use that to get a set of amplitudes at 100 meters away from the fold, which is shown in this histogram here. We can keep playing games with that and plot amplitude over throw. Throw here is uh, used as a proxy for time, right? We don't really have a sense of time from these data sets because they're finite. We're seeing the what the landscape looked like the day the plane flew over and collected the lighter data. But folds accrue slip, they accrue throw as they grow over time over multiple earthquakes. So the throw of the fault serves as a proxy for time in general. And when we do that, we see that amplitude scales with row over time. So if you take home messages from this part of the talk, it's like low amplitude folds are subtle, but they occupy large volumes. The folding amplitude is folding with fold row is time. And then these folds are accumulating about 5 to 25% of the total deformation in the area. So that's a non-negative amount. I'm going to skip the next slide in the interest of time, but may come back to that later. And I'm curious whether this is something that bothers you a lot, because it bothers me a lot. If this fracture mechanics uh, decay of stress with distance away from the fault is a good mechanical model for what's happening here, that is an elastic model. 
So how is a signal that looks predominantly elastic, but where the strength are? And we can just quickly to convince you take a quick strain measurement. So we have folds that are about one meter in amplitude at a hundred meters away from the fold. So if you take a simple shear strain, that's one over a hundred, it's a shear strain of 10 to the minus two, that's exceeding the elastic limit of rock by one or other magnitude. We see folds with much larger amplitudes at that same distance. But these folds look elastic. So how is something that's exceeding the elastic limit of rock by orders of magnitude stored in the landscape permanently without this elastic shape being distorted? And I cannot, it has, the strain has to be absorbed by the rock volume somehow, maybe during the post-seismic or the inter-seismic period. I cannot really tell you when it's happening, but I think the rocks tell us how it's happening. So to do that, we're actually going to go and do a quick field case study in one of these locations, the volcanic table lands in Eastern California. This is the Bishop Tap, which is the folded unit. And I'm gonna roughly subdivide the Bishop Tap into three units. And if you're a petrologist, I'm really sorry. These are my two units. I start with a folded tap on top. That's this very blocky section. Then a welded tap underneath. And then at the bottom, there's this search deposit that's very pumice rich. And I'm curious, given how different these rock units look like, but we know that the tap forms sort of as a single unit, how is strain accommodating within those different rock units in the Bishop tap? So I'm going to start by looking at this welded top tap. And it's characterized by these cooling blocks that are an inherited texture from cooling of the Bishop tap, which formed 738,000 years ago. And we're gonna take a field transect to look at two things. We're gonna look at fracture aperture and we're gonna look at block dimensions of the schooling box. So this is the LIDAR point cloud and I'm gonna go in the field from A to A prime. I'm gonna start right next to a fold in the full wall of it. I will cross a tiny fold that doesn't really have a big signal in the data, but it, it adds some noise. So when you see where noise, maybe you relate to that fold. And I'm gonna cross a larger fold and end at the hanging wall of a third fold. This is that transect thing in a different format. So elevation on this y-axis. And here's this in southern profile, as hood and arrow where each of the folds are. The blue areas in the back represent the hanging wall of the fold. The green areas represent the portable of the fold. The areas that are in white are covered by sand, so I don't have any measurements. And the first thing I'm going to look at is the distribution of fracture openings across the transect. And that is actually pretty noisy, but within the noise, you can see a trend emerge. And that is that in the foot wall of the folds, the fractures have larger apertures than they do in the hanging wall of the folds. Which makes sense if you think about it, because the foot wall of the fold is in tension and the hanging wall is getting squished. So it makes sense that your cracks are more open in the foot wall than they are in the hanging wall. But it's also telling you that the cracks are responding to the co seismic stresses on those folds, uh, around those folds. Okay, here's the next data set. This is block length, which is measured in the maximum direction. Uh, it's a maximum block length in the direction of the transect. And it's plotted throughout the transect. And it looks random with the exception that there's an overall decrease in block size as you move from A to A prime along the transect. And I think that's just an inherited cooling texture of the Bishop tap. I think that strain here is accommodated by fracture opening and closing without any internal block deformation. So in the presence of a pre-existing rock fabric that can be accommodated to, sorry, that can be exploited to accommodate those strains, the rock doesn't need to create any, any new damage. It's just toppling, opening and close to accommodate the folding strains and allowing that folding shape to remain predominantly elastic. We can also play some strain games, uh, magnitude games. So let's start with looking at the folding amplitudes. We know those are over 100 meters. I'm just gonna add this up, divided by 400. And here's roughly very, very back of the envelope approximation of, uh, of what the shear strain accommodated by folding is. I can also do a similarly very back of the envelope uh, approximation for what the opening elongation strains accommodated by fracture are. So I can add my fracture apertures, divide them by the length of the transect, and boom, 
we have something that's in the same order of magnitude of what we had looked for the shear strains. These are obviously different components of the string tensor, but they are of the same magnitude roughly. And again, a very back of the envelope approximation. If I look at the uh, underlying unit, this unwelded tap, that unit doesn't have a cooling texture or an apparent cooling texture, so, but it has fractures. So what we did is, this is the bone, it's buried in a rubble pile. And here's our top unit. You can already see that these two units look very differently. We took a fracture transect as we moved away from the fold, and we find is that the number of cracks is decreasing with distance away from the fold. This looks just like what you would expect in a damping zone. So in the absence of a pre-existing fabric that the rock can exploit to accommodate the strain, it has to nucleate cracks, and you get something that looks just like a damping zone. The body unit is still a little bit enigmatic for me. This is the porous surge deposit. Uh, it doesn't have any cracks. It doesn't have any apparent deformation, but it's very porous. So I do not have thin sections to claim this, but I don't think it's crazy to suggest that perhaps what's accommodating the strains within that bottom unit is pore opening and closure. So sort of to wrap this up, these folds are pretty large. Nick. The standard areas, the, their shape is well described by a sort of relationship. They may be rooted in, this may be rooted in simple fracture mechanics or not, you tell me. Um, the folding strains are about, are about on the uh, opening strains are about on the order of 10 to the minus two. And then I think the big take home point for me, at least what I learned from this, was that these lithological differences are resulting in differences of what the primary mechanism that accommodates the strain within the rock volume is. So when it comes to accommodating long-term deformation, what's pre-existing in the rock exerts a large control of how the strains are accommodated in the culture. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, questions? Thank you for the very interesting talk. I have a question on the slides. Um, like you analyzed a, quite a few earthquakes, like you know, like yes, in California. I wonder how those fracture density plots related to like fault maturity, like fault maturity. Yes, does that like have difference or connection? Um, like I think like the second part. Yes, yeah. <laughs> there's a long ways away. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Yes. So I think the curve book makes it hard to compare these is. It's important to keep in mind that these distributions are, are just the posterior distributions for this. So they're telling you how well this model is getting that data. But there's a lot of epistemic uncertainty that those do not really capture. So, so these slow the slow variability is bigger than that because it also depends on what someone decided was a fracture when they mapped it, right? And all of that uncertainty is not really encompassing here. So I would I would say that let's be cautious about how much we interpret these slopes. With that being said, um, the richest foreshock presumably is the most immature fault in there when you look at the cumulative displacement that those faults have accommodated. And it has the most gentle slope. And if you interpret slope <clears throat> as how wide the overall zone is, so, so as a proxy for strain localization, then it looks like the less mature you are, the more widespread, it would, the less localized your damage will be. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it beyond just using it as a speculation. Jing is looking at the Madoi earthquake and she's been very, very carefully looking at the density decays for different segments. That earthquake conveniently has scarps that, that turn and face in different directions where uh, one of the, the faults looks like, uh, sorry, one of the faults have much more cumulative deformation uh, displacement than the neighboring fault. And she's been finding a similar pattern to what I just described. And she's actually been more exhaustive, uh, so exhaustively considering fault maturity. So we should have more news on that soon. Thank you. Yes. I have a question about the logarithmic -like scale. I, I would think that as you eventually get far enough away from the fault, it would kind of even out and you would have no decay um, in, in fracture density. Do you, do you have any maps that go out further than 10 to the fourth, I guess, um, showing like a 
basically a plateau? Or? No, I will point out that what people call the outer edge of the damage zone, or where you hit background, it's typically much closer in than that 10 to the floor. And I think that to me, I, I don't, I don't see why co-seismic, if you're just looking at co-seismic data, I don't understand why the damage zone should have an edge. If, if that's just the, the response to the stress distribution around the fall, that that just goes on, right? Like till some like defining lens get like this is or something. But, but I don't, I don't, I can't think of any reason why a fault should, a damage zone should have an edge if you're just looking at it. Cause I think, well, maybe if you're piling up earthquakes over many, many earthquake cycles, then you get some apparent edge. But I don't see why that should appear in precise data. Uh, um, many of these earthquakes had shallow slip deficits, right? Where there's less localized slip near the surface. Mm -hmm. Are you able to? break up your data into areas where the rupture models had a high shallow slip deficit and vice versa to see if you see a correlation right between where clearly some of the yeah. localized slip is missing. That's a really good question. I have not done that and I kind of regret it because I only thought of that when the paper was published already, but I was thinking about these plots that, oh, those plots, right? That look quite different. I would say, well, it doesn't really look like the slip on the fault or the variability on the fault correlate with it. But that's your slip at the surface, right? Maybe if I integrate over some shallow area, then there will be a correlation between what this looks mm -hmm. like and what that looks like. And not just the amount of slip, but I think the gradient in slip towards the surface should also play a big role, right? Because it's that gradient that's going to drive stressing the surrounding volume. So no, I haven't checked, but I think it's a good place. Look. One last question. Uh, oh, was there is another? Where was that question? Oh, sure. Related to Roland's question, um, I'm curious if you've looked at paleo seismic data, because paleo seismic data can give you uh, some information about reactivation of fractures, uh, creation of new fractures, and overprinting. Yes. So these faults were trenched after the earthquake. Um, and I, I'm not aware, I, I'm, I'm aware that there are multiple events in the fault. I am not aware of anyone having looked at whether the all fault fractures themselves were reactivated. I'm not sure you would be able to tell paleo Yeah. You could ask us, ask Kosaki. He he did some repeat trenching. Okay. Yeah. But now have to update. No, that's the last question. Yeah. Um, I just have a question on this: whether you've compared the data to anything that slipped less than a meter. Say that again. Uh, so you you compare the the slip to um fracture densities. Things. I was just curious if you compared it to um, uh, to anywhere along the fault that slipped less than it. Do you have a zone with less slip? Less slip. Uh, Smaller slips. No. So the, the zones where we have this high resolution measurements were sort of arbitrary based on where the imagery to be able to do those was collected. I think the area here in the four, sorry, zone four. Uh, it has higher slip. I think there's a, a, the bottom part here. This is subdividing into two small patches in the imagery. I think the bottom patch had very, very little slip on the fault. It's very, very dense in terms of fracturing. Thank you. Cool. So if you have more questions, you can ask them on the balcony with beer and pizza. And let's thank Alba again for a great talk.